Jesus' followers were fed to wild animals for Roman entertainment. Then, as the story goes, the Roman Emperor Constantine had a vision of the cross, which inspired him to adopt Jesus as his savior. As a result, the West became Christian. But did Constantine really convert to Christianity? Or are modern Christians worshiping a version of Jesus created by a die-hard pagan? Decoding the Ancients is the job of investigative journalist Simka Yakubovich. From deserts to tombs, from Rome to the Holy Land, Simka tracks down the truth behind historical myths, long-held beliefs, and some of the greatest biblical stories ever told. Simka has come to Turkey, to the city of Istanbul. Back in the fourth century AD, Constantine built his new capital here and called it Constantinople. By that point, Constantine had already legalized Christianity. But it's still a matter of controversy whether Constantine himself became a true Christian. I'm underneath modern Istanbul, the city that Constantine built. Until Constantine, some 300 years after the crucifixion, Christianity was essentially an illegal movement. After Constantine, within a few years, a few decades, it would become the official religion of the Roman Empire and the reason why so much of the world today is Christian. The question is, who was he? And the religion that he created, is it a religion that Jesus would recognize? In the fourth century AD, the Roman Empire was divided into four major areas. Each region had its own ruler. But when Constantine's father, who ruled the West, died in York, England in the year 306, his army declared Constantine ruler of the entire Roman Empire. This sparked a bloody struggle to determine who would end up emperor. In the year 312, Constantine was pitted against the general Maxentius, who controlled the central region, including the city of Rome. Their famous struggle for power was depicted 1,200 years later in these frescoes by Renaissance artist Raphael. Based on early Christian sources, Raphael painted these narratives on the Vatican walls. And it's these frescoes that tell us the traditional story of how Constantine converted to Christianity. But there's a much older work of art that tells a different tale. It's called the Arch of Constantine. And Constantine himself had it built here, in the center of Rome, to celebrate his victory over Maxentius. Over six stories high, Constantine's arch was erected just 91 meters from the Colosseum, where Christians were once killed for sport. For fear of damage, the Department of Antiquities in Rome hasn't given anyone permission to examine it up close for more than 30 years. Until now. The closest you can get to Constantine is the arch behind me across from the Colosseum. It's Constantine's victory arch, and on it he sculpted his narrative. The problem is you can't get close to it. In 30 years, no one has. But now, we're gonna go up and take a look. In his quest to decode the arch, Simca is joined by Constantine expert Elizabeth Marlowe, who has seen the carvings on Constantine's arch only from ground level or in photographs. Until now, she has never seen them up close. Oh my God, look at that. That is so fantastic. Look how big they are. From this elevated perspective, Simca can now see how Constantine wanted his victory over Maxentius depicted in stone for all time. This is amazing, I'm excited. It's like spectacular a to be up here. Everyone should see Constantine's arch this way. Constantine's arch depicts the battle between Constantine and Maxentius for strategic control of the Milvian Bridge, just north of Rome. According to the tradition depicted in Raphael's paintings, Constantine's forces were greatly outnumbered. But then, Constantine is said to have had a vision of the cross, followed by a dream of Jesus that changed his life and ours 
forever. In that moment, Constantine was said to have denounced the Roman paganism that he was brought up with in favor of a newfound belief in Christianity. He ordered his soldiers to paint their shields and banners with the symbol of the cross and led his army to victory. He then went on to convert the entire Roman world to the Christian faith. That's what the Christian tradition tells us. But what does Constantine's arch have to say? In this panel, Constantine's face was deliberately hacked out by a long forgotten opponent to his legacy. Here, we can still clearly see the defeated Maxentius drowning in the river Tiber. But is there any evidence that Constantine really had a vision of the cross that converted him to Christianity? Coming Who's that guy here. behind him? That's one of his own men carrying a standard. That's a military standard. No cross there. No cross there. You can't see that from down below. No. I see a shield very clearly. Yes. No cross there. No, no. When we look at the evidence from Constantine's reign itself, the Arch of Constantine really being the best source we have in the years immediately following that battle, there's no trace of Christianity on this monument. No images of Jesus, no crosses, no Christian symbolism anywhere on his arch. Considering his vision, you would think Constantine would be championing Christianity. Is it possible that there was no vision at all? In Constantine's day, emperors had to win over the Roman army. Was the vision invented to win over Christian soldiers? But wait a minute, the Roman army persecuted Christians. It crucified Jesus. There wouldn't have been Christians in the Roman army. Maybe there were. To investigate the possibility of Christians in Constantine's army, Simca travels to Northern England, once the outer reaches of the Roman Empire. It's here where Constantine's rise to power began. The area is littered with Roman military forts, like this one, located at Hadrian's Wall on the Scottish border. And it's here that Andrew Burley has found evidence of Christians in the Roman army. Now, what do you make of it? Well, this is not a random thing. This is a very purposeful thing. Now, corresponding with the cross inside the, the room in this building here, on the section of the wall next door, there are seven crosses like this one inserted into the wall, all in one section of wall. To have seven so close together is very unusual. Third century Christian symbols carved into stone by the same Roman army that crucified Jesus. Evidence that Christians were fighting in Constantine's army even before Constantine came to power. Winning them over would have been of paramount importance. But were Christian soldiers also serving in his rival Maxentius's army? There'd be much more likely to be Christians in, in Maxentius' army than in Constantine. And Constantine's army was largely composed of people from, from the far barbarian north where Christianity had made very much less impact. So it seems Christians were well entrenched in the Roman military before either Constantine or Maxentius fought their famous battle for the Milvian Bridge. But if Maxentius also led Christians into his army, then what's so unique about Constantine's claim to be a Christian sympathizer? To learn more, Simca needs to find out what Maxentius really stood for. The only personal relics from Maxentius's reign were recently unearthed here, just meters from Constantine's arch, by archaeologist Clementina Panella. Panella believes that these royal scepters, spears, and weapons belong to Maxentius himself and were venerated by his faithful followers, just as Christians venerate the cross. Ritrovato il corpo di Massenzio, Costantino taglia la testa di Massenzio e la porta in città. E Costantino, ovviamente, avendo vinto col sangue, deve dare del nemico la peggiore presentazione. Quindi Massenzio è il tiranno, i panegirici dicono le cose più terribili di questo Massenzio, i vizi più turpi gli sono attribuiti e la memoria di Massenzio viene, come al solito, cancellata. 
Upon his victory, Constantine tried to wipe Maxentius from history's good books by portraying him as a pagan tyrant and a Christian persecutor. Però Massenzio invece è stato un grande imperatore e Massenzio non diede fastidio ai cristiani. E io mi chiedo che cosa sarebbe successo eh, se Costantino non avesse vinto. Che cosa sarebbe successo della nostra civiltà che poi è piena di cristianesimo e noi siamo dei discendenti di questa ma di questa battaglia. So if the image we have of Maxentius as an evil pagan tyrant has been fabricated, is it possible that the image we have of Constantine as a Christian emperor has also been fabricated? To answer that question, Simca now investigates a secret religion that claimed the most powerful people in the empire as its followers. This religion worshipped a pagan god who had an uncanny resemblance to Jesus. Early Christian history states that the Roman Emperor Constantine received a divine vision of Jesus before defeating his arch-rival Maxentius, winning control of the Roman Empire and causing the Western world to become Christian. But was Constantine a true Christian? The most important statement we have from him is his triumphal arch in Rome. On it, Simca doesn't find a single Christian icon, but he does find pagan symbols. On this panel, Constantine is surrounded by pagan gods, the god of the river Tiber, a winged goddess of victory, and by Roma, goddess of Rome, an archeological patchwork of pagan symbolism compelling evidence that Constantine only adopted Christian ideas to gain favor with Roman soldiers in both his and Maxentius's armies. But winning over common soldiers wasn't enough. To gain control over the entire Roman Empire, Constantine needed the support of the officer corps and the Roman elite. Many members of these classes belonged to a mysterious cult that had been around since before Jesus. That cult was called Mithraism named after a Mediterranean sun god called Mithras. How did Constantine mobilize both these religions to serve his own ends? Can it be that what appealed to him was a blend of Mithraism and Christianity? Did he fuse the two together to create a super religion that would allow him to gain control over the entire Roman world? Not far from the Roman military fort where Simca has seen evidence of Christian soldiers in Constantine's army, another fort was discovered in 1949 by a French bulldog sniffing for bones. But instead of bones or Christian symbols, this fort revealed a special temple built by Roman officers that were devoted to the pagan god, Mithras. My father's dog, same breed as this one, a uh, French bulldog, was sniffing around and found the middle altar. As you can see, it's very wet here. It was all preserved due to the dampness. Now, this is close to the Roman fort? Yes, and it was 500 foot soldiers, and Mithras was for the officers. So that's why it's so small. So the Roman officer class which Constantine belonged to, secretly worshipped Mithras at this temple. At the exact same time, an increasing number of ordinary Roman soldiers were worshipping Jesus right next door. Mithraism was an elitist and secret religion, practiced only by men. Initiates walked into this clandestine temple, lit only by a few torches. Arriving at the front of the temple, these initiates would have seen an altar to the god Mithras, rays projecting from his head. Lit from behind by candlelight, the halo effect symbolized Mithras's status as a sun god, a striking precursor to the halo that surrounds the head of Jesus. This could be mere coincidence if it weren't for the fact that archaeologists have found the remains of Mithraic temples all over the Roman Empire. And more often than not, 
those temples were found hidden beneath the world's first Christian churches. To see one of these Mithraeums, Simca now goes to the Santa Prisca Church in Rome. Here, excavators pulled up the floor of the church and discovered one of the largest Mithraic temples ever found. In cavernous, dark rooms like these, the Roman elite would worship in secret. This is amazing. I feel like I'm in the Notre Dame Cathedral <laughs> of Mithraism. Well, this is a pretty sizable one. The idea is, is this is a recreation of the primal cave where Mithras commits the sacrifice of the bull, which is the core event in Mithraism. The one source of light in this dark temple illuminates the centerpiece, a bas relief that depicts the main myth of Mithraic belief. Jutting out from the primordial rock, the sun god Mithras, the son of the sun, slaughters the sacrificial bull. And through the shedding of his blood, the universe is created anew. Essentially what we're seeing is Mithras being seen as the key creator god who makes possible the regeneration of life. And you've got the primordial rock, you know, the cocoon out of which the whole universe is born. Impressive, but it also sounds pretty pagan. And yet, a strange inscription here suggests a more Christian approach. We don't have many inscriptions of Mithras. Right. It's a secret, and they didn't write that much. This is unusual, this place, that it does have a very faded inscription. That now. is correct. One particular text, the Latin translates as, and you have saved us through the shedding of the eternal blood. You have saved us through the shedding of the eternal blood. Yes. So here, the central bloodletting yes. is seen as an act of salvation. Yes, and the, the key event in the whole nature of cosmic creation and the whole nature of life. Mithras sacrifices the bull and spills its blood. Strangely corresponding to the Christian concept of Jesus offering his own blood to save mankind. But the similarities don't end there. A lot of the Mithraic rituals very closely corresponded to what the Christians would do in their worship. The sacred meal that they would participate in is taking the body or the blood of the sacrifice by sharing a meal of bread and wine. Here? Here. So it's communion. It's a basically a communion, a Eucharist. And those who partake in this feast will live forever. So just as Christians reenact the Last Supper with Jesus before his death, a form of communion was also practiced here. And just as Jesus died and was resurrected, so was Mithras. Which is why at this altar, Mithras is pictured right next to a sculpture of an Egyptian god. And this particular god, if you look carefully at his forehead, you notice that little lock that hangs yeah. down there? That's actually what signify that he is the reconfiguration of the god Osiris. And Osiris is the dying exactly. and resurrected right. god of the Egyptians. Right. Just like Christians, Mithraeus believed in the concept of resurrection, which may explain why both religions were popular to members of the Roman military. Faced with the daily risk of death, who wouldn't put their faith in the possibility of resurrection and eternal life? But what's most compelling is evidence that Mithras's followers celebrated his holy birth on December 25th, the same day that Christians would later celebrate the birth of Jesus. It was shocking to me when I learned that nobody talked about Jesus' birthday as December 25th when, right. when Jesus <laughs> was walking the earth. Yes. It was Mithras' birthday. That is correct. And this is because December 25th was for the Romans always a traditional important holiday, the feast of the Saturnalia, which went on for 12 days. <laughs> and everybody was expected to give presents during oh that goodness. time period. And so, so suddenly 12 days, gift giving, December 25th. And a lot of these symbols do find their way into Christian iconography. As it turns out, Mithraism is embedded in the gospels themselves through the story of the three wise men. At the Church of St. Apollinaire Nuovo in Ravenna, Italy, 
the iconography is still Mithraic. Here we have the three wise men, also known as the Magi. This is the scene as recounted at the birth of Christ, that these three wise men are bringing these gifts to the Christ child. And the hats that they're wearing, in Greco-Roman art, this sort of became the standard hat that would be used in their artwork to denote somebody who is an Easterner. But these hats weren't worn by just any non-Christian from the East. Called Phrygian caps, they were the official hats of the Mithraic priesthood, also known as the Magi. Even Mithras is depicted wearing the same style of hat. And although there are no Christian symbols on the Arch of Constantine, the arch is literally ringed by eight Magi-looking figures wearing the Phrygian hats of the Mithraic priesthood. But if Constantine was the worshiper of a sun god, how could he have championed Christianity? Unless he created a new version of Christianity, partially fashioned in the image of Mithras. To do that, he would have had to convince Christians that he was one of them, while in reality supporting the introduction of pagan ideas into their faith. And to do that, I believe Constantine needed the help of someone someone working on the inside of the early Christian church. Constantine is known to history as the emperor who converted the Roman Empire to the teachings of Jesus. But the Arch of Constantine has no Christian symbolism on it whatsoever. And evidence found beneath the first Christian churches suggests that Constantine fused Mithraism with Christianity to win the patronage of the powerful Roman elite. But this leaves one problem. How could Constantine get true Christians to go along with his version of their faith? And what about the founding fathers of the church? After years of persecution, of worshiping in secret, surely they wouldn't let Constantine manipulate their religion for his gain. Or would they? There's compelling evidence to suggest that Constantine's vision was a postscript to what really happened at the Milvian Bridge. As it turns out, while Constantine was still alive, there was only one church father who recorded Constantine's life and his celebrated conversion to Christianity. His name was Eusebius, and besides becoming Constantine's sole biographer, he also became Constantine's right-hand man in the Christian world. According to Eusebius's writings, it's here at the Milvian Bridge, north of Rome, that Constantine had a vision of the cross and a dream about Jesus that inspired him to win the battle and change the world forever. So here's the Milvian Bridge. This is the bridge that gets associated with the battle. So this bridge behind you becomes, in a sense, a metaphor for the change of human history. Yes. The bridge becomes a way to refer to, not necessarily the battle itself, but the consequences of the battle. Yet in Eusebius's first draft of this account, he doesn't mention Constantine's vision at all. No vision, no dream yet. So Eusebius's first account of the Battle of the Milvian Bridge that took place somewhere right where we're standing, even Eusebius, who's like... Yes, sir church father, bishop, great yes. admirer of Constantine does not mention visions. In that account, no. Without a vision of Jesus, how did Constantine convince his contemporaries that he had converted to Christianity? Eusebius' own writings suggest that Constantine persuaded Eusebius to rewrite his account of the Milvian Bridge during a great banquet that Constantine held for the leaders of the Christian Church in the year 325. After years of persecution, Eusebius and his fellow bishops were now being hosted by the emperor himself. And it seems that it was at this banquet, 13 years after the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, that Eusebius first heard anything about Constantine's vision. So Constantine tells the story about the vision of the cross before the battle at the Milvian Bridge. When Constantine tells the story, he emphasizes, first of all, the vision of a cross in the sky at noontime. Secondly, 
He then had a dream in which Jesus Christ himself appeared and explained the vision to him. Almost he, like a, he's a prophet. He has visions, he has dreams. Jesus speaks to him. Precisely. And here, in these original texts by Eusebius, one can see the impact of Constantine's story on Eusebius and his fellow bishops. So here's Eusebius' description of the banquet. He compares this banquet with the emperor to the coming of Jesus. And Christians had anticipated if there was going to be a Christian ruler, it might well be Jesus come back to earth. And now suddenly it turns out to be the emperor himself. Now portrayed as a Christ-like figure, Constantine turned his so-called vision into the official history. And that history was soon propagated by Christian art. Here we have Raphael. Yes. Now, Raphael, when he paints, he paints the vision in the sky. It's a cross by this right. sign you will conquer and so on. This is mythology becoming history. Yes. Even without knowing the narrative, you just want to stare at these frescoes. So this is sort of a last attempt to reaffirm this papal narrative, which had already been shown to be a fiction. A myth based not on history, but on a fiction. But if Eusebius's biography of Constantine represents the myth, what did Constantine really believe in? The only direct link we have to Constantine is his arch, which is adorned by pagan symbols. But on it, we can also see reliefs depicting three former emperors. The philosopher Marcus Aurelius, the conqueror Trajan, and the statesman Hadrian all stolen from previous monuments and strategically recycled for his arch. Begging the question, why would Constantine decorate a monument to his own achievements with reliefs taken from other emperors, unless he was really saying something about himself? Isn't he telling us what everybody thinks are winners are really losers? And me, I'm, I'm the real winner. At the end of the day, I'm going to refashion the world in a way that Hadrian Trajan and Marcus Aurelius could not even imagine. I would agree with you that Constantine would have been very happy if people looking at his arch had been able to take away the message that he is going to supersede the legacy of even Rome's best previous emperors. But how was he going to do that? The answer may lie at the very top of the arch. Here, there is an inscription, and it states in Latin, Instinctu Divinitatis, which describes Constantine as divinely inspired. But if it's not Jesus who's inspiring him, which God is? When looking at what's depicted on his arch, what we find are pagan gods from the Roman pantheon, and none so prominently rendered as the sun god Apollo. The light is amazing. And it's so appropriate with the rising of the sun god right there to have it illuminated by the sun this way. Before Constantine's alleged vision, he followed the official religion of the Roman Empire, the imperial cult, a pagan religion that worshiped Apollo above all else. Much like the pagan god Mithras, Apollo was the sun god that represented the light of creation. According to the imperial cult, Constantine, as emperor, was a superhuman avatar, the link between Apollo and the rest of humanity. And from the archaeology, it's clear that Constantine bought into this idea completely. He commissioned this 12-meter statue of himself. And not surprisingly, the statue came with an enormous head. Built into this statue's healthy hairline may be evidence that Constantine believed he was more than a mere representative of Apollo. There are dowel holes that certainly were for some kind of insert, and it seems likely that it was for a rayed crown. That's not Christian to me. To me, that's saying, I am God. 
Right. There's absolutely no humility uh, in any of Constantine's self-fashioning. I mean, he's very happy to have a 40-foot-tall statue of himself looming over this space in the center of Rome. He allows cities in the north of Italy to erect cults to his family to worship him as a god. He's aloof, he's yes. giant, and he's yes. godlike. Yes, he's superhuman. He is superhuman. The image of Constantine with sun rays emanating from his head not only matches the earliest images of Apollo, it also matches the iconography of Mithras. And is it just coincidence that Christian art begins to depict Jesus the same way, with a halo of light around his head? Or was Constantine combining all the gods of light into one? When Constantine claimed to have had a vision of the Melvian Bridge, which religion was Constantine truly embracing? Did Constantine abandon paganism for Christianity? Or did he blend Apollo and Mithras into Jesus Christ and then refashion all three in his own image? As it turns out, when Constantine had his arch built, he topped it off with a bronze portrait of himself. Destroyed in antiquity, this statue depicted him riding the same kind of chariot as Apollo, seemingly taking off into sunny skies. Constantine is known to history as the first Roman emperor to convert to Christianity, legalize it, and thereby change the world. But the archaeology he left behind suggests an alternative history. His triumphal arch is covered with pagan symbols, and from the statues he erected of himself, it seems that Constantine not only worshipped pagan gods, he saw himself as having a special relationship with them. If Constantine saw himself as divinely ordained, he would have seen his reign as a new founding. He would have believed that he was responsible for changing the course of human history. And the new founding needs a new capital. Rome would no longer do. So he went to what is today Istanbul in modern-day Turkey, and he founded a new capital for his new empire. He didn't name it after Jesus or the apostles. Rather, he stayed true to his nature, and he named it after himself. He called the new city Constantinople. He left Rome, and he certainly never returned there again. Settled on this incomparable site. It bridges the two continents. It's strategically and tactically located in, in virtually an ideal position, easily defended. And I think he wanted a monument to himself. He wanted his own city with his own imprint on it. Despite Constantine's reputation as the first Christian emperor, the most dominant feature of Constantinople's skyline was not a Christian church, but a giant column that was once topped by a huge bronze statue of the sun god, Apollo. The statue is long gone, and the column is under renovation. But at the time of Constantine, people were worshiping the sun god here. When the city was built, this was a big plaza or forum, and that column was in the center of it. It's about 100 feet in the air. What's significant about it is that in subsequent years, Christian bishops and theologians were very upset about the fact that the people of Constantinople conducted divine services here. And yet, Constantine's statue of Apollo was not like other pagan images. He did make a slight modification to it. He replaced Apollo's face with his own. But what's even better is the tradition continues that in this statue, he put a relic of the true cross. So he's attaching relics of Jesus to, or inserting them in this statue. So he erects a statue of himself, and this statue depicts him as Apollo, but for good measure, we've got a little bit of the true cross mixed in. Yes. Did Constantine pull off the greatest hoax of all time by pretending to be a Christian? Was he actually equating himself with both Apollo and Jesus? Or did he merely see himself as their special emissary? To find out, Simca returns to the Arch. But this time, 
he's not looking at what's on the arch. This time, he's looking at how the arch was positioned. From this bird's eye view, he's reminded that Constantine's arch is off-center by almost two meters from the original road that ran through it. But why? The Romans were famous for their feats of engineering. Surely they wouldn't make a mistake when building the emperor's new arch. There had to be some other reason, a reason that must be hiding in plain sight. Based on ancient records, we know that during Constantine's time, there was a colossal statue that stood 108 meters behind the arch. But this was not just any statue. It was a 30 meter high monument to Apollo. Is there a connection between the statue and the arch? Expert Elizabeth Marlowe thinks she's found that connection. So then I started playing around on the living room floor in my apartment, where I made a little cutout of the arch and I propped it up and I got a doll and I set him up and then set the arch up in front of him and I worked out the proportions very carefully, lying down and peering through the central passageway. For me, that was the aha moment. Based on her living room reconstructions, Marlow came up with a compelling new theory as to why Constantine's arch was built where it was. But to prove her theory, Marlow first had to brave rush hour Roman traffic so that she could gain the right perspective. The evidence on the ground confirmed her hypothesis. Constantine's arch was built off center on the road so as to perfectly frame the Colossus of Apollo behind it. According to Marlow, as you entered Rome, you would have seen Apollo's head looming above the statue of Constantine on his arch, as if watching over Constantine. But as you moved closer to the arch itself, the sun god would have dropped below Constantine until he was left standing in the center of the main archway. At the point when the statue is framed in the central passageway, it is the figure of Constantine that is now looming above in the sky. As the sun is setting, what is rising is... is Constantine, yes, yes. The arch is literally a reframing of the sun god, with Constantine on top of the arch. Marlowe has revealed a clear example where, on the surface, Constantine seems to be putting himself under Apollo, but covertly, he is letting us know that he is greater than Apollo. Can it be that he did the same with Christianity, seemingly worshiping Jesus while replacing Jesus with himself? Our investigation has revealed that Constantine merged the great pagan sun gods Mithras and Apollo and replaced their images with his own. Maybe that's not blasphemy by Christian standards, but it does tell us what Constantine thought of himself. By depicting himself with rays of light coming out of his head, Constantine was telling the world that he was to be worshipped as a god. Now, where does that leave Christianity? Was Constantine willing to step aside and bow down to the king of the Jews as any Christian would? I don't think so. I think Constantine took Jesus and refashioned him in his own image thereby turning the anti-Roman rebel we read about in the Gospels into a symbol of Roman imperialism. To find evidence for this, Simca travels to the Archbishop's Chapel in Ravenna, Italy, where there's a 6th century mosaic that depicts Jesus in a whole new light. That's a mosaic of Jesus dressed as a Roman soldier, although if you look at it more carefully, you can see that he's actually a Roman emperor dressed for command. He's got the military equipment, and of course he has the cross over his shoulder. So when you can kind of see that Christ is also taking on the, the role of being the Roman emperor. He's depicted as the emperor. As the emperor in a military role. So Constantine didn't start running around dressed like Jesus. Right. He got Jesus to dress like him. Right. The irony is that after Constantine, Jesus, who had been crucified by the Roman army, was now depicted as its leader. But what was Constantine's goal? Was he trying to change Jesus? Or was he trying to replace him? 
To answer this question, Simka now looks into the plans Constantine made for his own funeral. Well, he was actually buried in, uh, in Constantinople in the Church of the Holy Apostles, which no longer exists. It was reported that he was buried with the 12 apostles surrounding him. So Constantine prepares his burial by creating a real coffin for himself. Right. And then these pretend coffins for the other disciples. Right. If you take Jesus' place, one way to interpret it is I, I am Jesus. Well, you could see it that way. On Earth, the Roman emperors do become the stand-in for Jesus because now with the Christian Roman Empire, the emperor takes on the role as being the leader of the worldwide Christian community. But by taking Jesus' place, did Constantine see himself as someone who could promote Jesus' message or subvert it? Can the arch also answer this question? From this high vantage point, Simca suddenly makes a discovery that would have never occurred to him below. How you position something relative to something else, that's sacred geometry. He's essentially putting himself in a relationship with the Flavians. Just on the other side of Constantine's arch is the famous Colosseum built by the Emperor Vespasian Flavius. Across on the left is a triumphal arch built by the same emperor's son, Titus Flavius. And in the center, where there is now a circular depression in the grass, once stood a giant fountain built by Vespasian's other son, Domitian Flavius, one of the greatest persecutors of early Christianity. Why would Constantine want to associate himself so intimately with the Flavian dynasty? As it turns out, the first century Flavian emperors have gone down in history as the men who destroyed Jerusalem and the holy temple in it. They could literally boast that they had torched the house of God. Jesus wept for the destruction of the temple. In contrast, by positioning his arch in close proximity to the destroyers of the temple, Constantine was permanently linking his legacy with theirs. But if that wasn't enough, he celebrated the Flavian name as his own. He called himself Flavius Constantinus. Could it be that just as the Flavians boasted that they had defeated the God of Israel, Constantine schemed to defeat the religion that worshiped Jesus as God's son? But as we have seen, Constantine was going to do it, not by oppressing Christianity, but by adopting it. Not by defeating it, but by defining it. He would out Flavian the Flavians. He wouldn't fight people, he would fight their ideas. He would defeat Jesus by transforming him from a crucified Judean rebel into a Roman emperor. For 1,500 years, people accepted the story that Constantine was a true Christian, that he had a vision of the cross, and that he converted a pagan Roman Empire to Christianity. But our investigation has revealed another story, one that isn't particularly Christian. We're not the first. Other investigators have noticed discrepancies in Constantine's character, but they concluded that maybe he wasn't religious. Maybe he was just pragmatic. But maybe he was religious after all. Not in a Christian sense, but in a pagan sense. It seems that he put his faith in the sun. He believed in the sun's only begotten son, himself.